Hi everyone, Jennifer Zeller, Abundance Real Estate. We're here again today with TJ Ebert, ProVisor Mortgage. Uh, and we're excited to delve into the third piece. So we've done three parts of you know the lending and home buying process and how they work together. The first piece was just getting your pre-approval. Then when you're in the offer stage, today we're gonna talk very excitingly about you have an accepted offer and what happens now. And you might have felt like you did a lot of the work building up to it, but now that we're, you know, have the accepted offer, there, you know, there's a little bit more pieces to work through to make sure that we get you to that happy solution of a closed home. Yes. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Let's um, do a housekeeping. housekeeping yeah, so I'm, I'm TJ Ebert. I'm a loan officer with Provisor Inc. Uh, we're out of Brookfield, equal housing lender. My NMLS is 506744 and Pro Provisors is 1802853. And we are an equal housing lender. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> you did that like it rolled right off. So how have you been? Good? Doing good. Yes. Yeah. It's where, you know, and everyone kind of anticipating for there to be a break in a, in a good way for the housing yeah. market, but rates and inventory are both kind of sticking, sticking to their guns and not <laughs> making much movement. <laughs> I know it's really true. Like we're, you know, depending like on some of the counties in the Milwaukee area, I feel like there's a little bit more listings here or there, but really overall there's, you know, I was comparing last year's sales to this year's sales in the first two months. And in some cities in Ozaki County, it was half. It was really crazy. Yeah. And last year seemed a little slower too. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but what, you know, we'll get there. Absolutely. And I think, you know, like we've talked about the past as opportunities for people who are willing or able to have a little bit higher price to get the home that they want now, as opposed to, you know, when either the rates break or there's more inventory, you know, TVJ and I are talking, we're already hearing homes going over, mm -hmm. um, decent amount. And so when more homes come and more buyers are there, it's going to even be I feel like a little crazier. Yes. And I, I heard I heard a great, um, really successful realtor out of the Chicago area had a great quote. He put it as, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. Ooh. The premise there is you wait, yeah. you're going to lose out on the home value appreciation versus buy when you are able to, and then you are going to gain the appreciation. Say that again, because I do like that. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. Yeah. I was talking, um, I was listening to Barbara Cochran, Shark Tank, and she was kind of like talking about that too. Like real estate is the opportunity to get really rich, really slow. Like it takes a while, but that's like the way part of it. Yes. Um, and she was even saying like, she's willing to pay over on some of them because she's going to do the wait. Like you're in the right location and you're going to hang on to the property, mm -hmm. you know, do the wait. All right. So let's dive in. So we've got to the, we're working together. We got a client and accepted offer. And so the first thing that we're going to do once we have, the, well, just to recap, so we're out looking at houses, we have, you know, a general idea of what they can look at. <clears throat> and then we make an offer when we make the offer, going to reach out to you, mm -hmm. say we're writing an offer. And then what are you going to do? I'm just going to do a quick review of the property, take care of re reviewing the items that go into ultimately what the pre-approval is based upon. Um, it's not necessarily just a loan amount. It's a monthly payment that the pre approvals base and it's comprised of. So looking at what are the property taxes of that home? Are there any homeowners association dues, whether it's a condo or in in a, a neighborhood that has HOA fees and just build that in to make sure that it's below the monthly payment that you were pre-approved for. Yeah, and I think the key and like really is to realize like the piece is in there, right? It's not the set amount that you can be writing an offer on. It's the pieces that go into the total payment. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like because I'm working with someone right now, we're looking at condos and even within condos, you know, a condo in Milwaukee is going to be different than a condo in Washington County, different taxes, you know, different HOAs. And so I was talking to my clients saying like, look, we can push a little bit further here in Manhattan Falls and maybe we could. And so, all right, so we got our offer. We got our personalized pre-approval for that property and accepted offer. Hey, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then. I'm going to, you know, we're, Michelle and I are going to send, we'll get our transaction coordinator involved. And between the three of us, we're going to send over the accepted offer to you. And then what's going to happen from there? So my, my first step is to review the accepted offer, to look at the contingencies that are in there, if there are any inspection or appraisal gaps, um, what the financing contingency is, financing commitment due date is with that. Usually it's a certain number of days from the accepted offer date. And 
I take a quick scan, make sure that everything looks looks as expected, and then I'm going to take the terms of that pre-approval, or sorry, terms of the accepted offer, the purchase price, the anticipated down payment, and rerun rate options for for that loan scenario because the rate options that we covered during your pre-approval conversation, it's very unlikely they're gonna be the exact same rates. Markets change minute to minute. Um, so I wanna be able to get updated information so that once I have that, we'll set up another quick Zoom call to be able to review those rate options once more and allow you the, the give you the information to make which, uh, make, make the choice as which rate lock option you wanna move forward. And rate lock simply means that you are you're locking in that rate. You're removing any potential movement, any potential change in your interest rate. So do you usually rock, lock in the rate like immediately after accepted offer? Is it like, you know, before closing, obviously, how does that work? When is it usually locked in? So it can be, it's it's completely different. It's really a matter of how um, how confident the buyer is in their decision. And if I've done my job, if we've gone through that mock rate lock consultation and the pre-approval interactions, um, they're more inclined, more confident to make a quicker decision. Because as I said, if if there's any hesitation, any waiting period, if someone wants to talk with somebody else about that rate option, well, the rate that we talk about now in an hour, in 20 minutes, that, that rate lock option could be different. It could be better, it could be worse, but it could be different. And so my my, you know, belief is that it's never a bad time to lock in a rate. And I say that because the vast majority of people, you know, if you were to give them the choice of would you would you feel better about waiting, gambling and getting a better rate and basically saving money? Or would you feel worse about waiting and getting a worse rate? Most people will say that the feeling of worse outweighs the feeling of better. So better, better take action and, and remove that worst case scenario. And so in like, you say you lock in at a rate, like let's say it was like seven and rates dropped to like six, seven, five before you close, you're still locked into the seven, right? Like that's kind of like you're saying though. But potentially, potentially there. So based on the nature of, of kind of my uh, company's profile is more of a broker lender. If rates move, there is potential that we're able to you know, look at getting a better rate option somewhere else. It doesn't guarantee it because as, as Jennifer, you were alluding to, by locking in, you are kind of, you know, you're committing to a certain level of of that deal of the rate. It's not as though we can, you know, take the, anytime there's a better rate, anytime between that and, and closing yeah. date that we can change it because, you know, the lender wouldn't do the opposite to you and the rates get worse. And the, oh, by the way, we're changing here. We're increasing <laughs> your interest rate an eight four percent just because the market's right. got worse. So there, it's it's never an all or nothing thing. Um, sometimes if you know if rates move significantly, we can help recapture some of that movement, but usually it's not one hundred percent of that movement. And I feel like generally probably it's not moving that much in like thirty days, hopefully. <laughs> Unless yeah. it's like July 2021 or whatever. <laughs> um, okay, and then one of the questions you talked about, like you give them lending options. Like, can you just give an idea, like in general terms, like what would like what would they be looking at different? Like, is it different types of product, like conventional versus FHA, or is it different down payments? Or yeah, so typically it would be a difference in down payments. Um, some okay. people have have the means to put more money down. I'll give them an option of, hey, here's a 10% down, here's a 15% down, here's a 20% down option. And so they can determine if the upfront investment is best for them or if there might be better use of holding on to those funds. Maybe they can maybe they can put money into a quick renovation they wanted to do right away. And that can conversely increase the value of their home. Uh, so that's one component. The other is within rate options, most individuals are familiar with paying points to, to get a better interest rate. Well, that's one thing I'll show. I'll also show if it makes sense to go the other way and absorb a higher interest rate at the start to help offset some of that out-of-pocket cost. And that's that's not necessarily best for everyone, but unless some individuals are wanting to hold on to that cash in their in their account without putting that all on the closing table. On the purchase of their home, so there are multiple options, and, and that's really why I want to invest that time to make you confident in the decision you make, so that you aren't regretting, you know, committing an extra five percent of your purchase price as a down payment. And so, and once you kind of make that, so you picked your choice. Do you, do you, when you're working with someone, have an idea of which one you think they should 
choose like like or is it kind of like these are all good choices you pick what's right for you it's it's usually that they're they're all decent choices sometimes there's an outlier that um, make, doesn't make any sense but generally they're all they're all wise decisions it's simply a matter of what makes you most comfortable yeah. on there it's never a bad decision it's simply there are options and and mo i will say most of the time on um, the the client side of things there's one that jumps out to them that okay. makes sense that's good yeah because you, you don't want to be in a position like oh, i don't know mm -hmm. so, okay so we picked our option now you've had the meeting with them and you've talked about their different rate of options they pick their option now what happens yeah so now now you know my my role for me and my processing team we kind of kick it into hyperdrive so we are um getting all of the final application the package put together to be ultimately sent to the underwriter and so that's going to entail getting some some disclosures sent to you for you to sign off on saying you do intend to proceed with the loan with with me and my company uh, we're going to send you initial loan estimate that will have conservative estimates for the the total fees for, that will go into the loan closing as well as the estimate for how much cash you will be having to have available at the time of closing and so we get all of that sent over we package it all send it to the underwriter so that they can begin reviewing all of your information as quickly as possible while um, while we're doing that my team is also going to be looking at is there any documentation that we got initially for your pre-approval that maybe is a little bit too old to be able to use for the underwriter review and we'll be reaching out to you to get updated bank statements a key component that the underwriter needs to see is one do you have the funds available that you'll need for the total cash to close and then two the earnest money check we have to see that the check has cleared your account so that'd be an example of a bank statement we might need updated pay stubs um if you're in a position where you're receiving a gift we would need a gift letter and you know proof of that gift check deposited but then kind of the the next biggest thing that would need to take place is ordering the appraisal now depending upon the timeline how quickly the closing is taking place sometimes buyers will want to have the inspection if they are choosing to order an inspection have the inspection take place first before ordering and paying for an appraisal okay if we have a shorter timeline maybe it's a three to four week close we we likely wouldn't have that luxury so we would want to order the appraisal right away hopefully get the appraiser out there within the week and so we can get the appraisal back within you know week and a half two weeks of accepted offer okay. and how much does appraisal generally cost um appraisal is generally you know 550 to 650 is the general range for a single family usually it's it's closer to that 550 mark if and that's built less. into the closing statement correct correct so it would be something where um you, you as the buyer you would pay for it and then it would be accounted for on the for your total closing costs where you would be you would receive credit at closing for what you've already paid okay and now so the appraiser is independent from your company right like it's a so that and i'm sure that makes sense you don't have influence in it right Correct. so they're independent mm -hmm. and how what about the underwriters do they work for your company is that how does that work together so yeah um similarly to the appraiser the underwriters are not a part of my company um we work we work with other investor banks who will be reviewing it reviewing your file to make sure that we are not again skewing anything or overlooking mm -hmm. anything because the key component is every loan that we do has to be has to fit federal guidelines for conventional loans the fannie mae guidelines and freddie mac guidelines so the underwriter's responsibility is to ensure that every piece of information and documentation fits those guidelines so yes the the underwriter is a another third party review process to ensure that they're everything is been reviewed and passes passes the test yeah. i think it's a good example to like you don't realize like what your laundry is doing for you behind the scenes you don't realize what your agent's doing behind the scenes you know like they're courting those two pieces and you don't really know that they're going on i mean you're you know getting updates on the but they're not like you have to make those connections and all yeah. that it's okay so well, you they've had the inspection you scheduled the appraisal um oh one thing also that you talked about i was curious so like sometimes it takes a while like right you started the pre-approval process that was six months ago and you had mentioned needing new documents like how off like would you need a, all new documents if it's like six months later how does that work it, um i mean we, most 
a lot of times if it's six months, we would need a lot of due documents because pay subs that were from six months ago, we may have a different pay rate on there. Um, and pay, most of the time pay subs need to be in the last 60 days in order for it to be able to be calculated with income. So we need updated pay statements or pay stubs, those bank statements, as I mentioned. And then another piece is credit report. If the credit, if our pre-approval was six months ago, that credit report is only good for 120 days and has to be valid uh, through the day of closing. So we would yeah. retrieve a new copy of our credit report as well. Um, it's like from an agent standpoint, like question, do you, like, is it best if we reach out to you for kind of a long, let's say we're three months in the process, is it good for us to reach out and say, hey, are we still good in this range? Or is that not necessary? Like More communication is always, okay. always better. For a simple fact of, um, and, and I, I like to keep regular communication with you mm -hmm. know, my buyers that are out there looking to simply check to see, hey, has anything changed with your pay at work? Maybe it's you got a bonus, Better. maybe yeah. increase, or you know, maybe it goes the other direction. That would be important to factor in. Uh, sometimes individuals will not necessarily understand the impact, but if someone, they needed to get a new vehicle and now they have car loan, well, when I call and check in on that, one of the things I will ask every time is, has, have you applied, have you received any new debt since we pulled your credit report? Okay. And if so, that could very well impact the pre-approval amount in addition to the current rate market. If, you know, right. have a rate, if, if rates increased dramatically since your pre-approval, that's going to adjust the pre-approved amount. All right. Okay. All right. So we got it out to appraisal. The underwriter's working on it. Now what happens? So uh, typically before the appraisal gets back because they when the appraiser does the in-person appraisal they have one one week to get the report back to us so generally before the appraisal report comes back we hear back from the underwriter with what's called their conditional approval and what this means is they're reviewing everything that we submitted as the initial application all the documentation in your credit report that we had submitted and they're reviewing it and saying we need these you know it could be Two things, it could be 14 things, additional documentation or, or additional steps taken to be able to get your loan fully approved. And one of those components will always be the appraisal. The appraisal has to be reviewed by the underwriter before the underwriter will issue a final approval on there. So that's always one thing. Um, most common other ones would be seeing the earnest money check, a copy of the check and that the check has cleared the account. Okay. Um, and so, that kind of leads into the next question then like it's probably really important that buyers like when you're working with them that they respond to you quickly like if you're asking for new things right like i mean is that got to be a key part of it <laughs> absolutely because if if me or my team is asking you know a buyer to provide any documentation it's because the underwriter who is kind of the gatekeeper to the final approval, they're needing it. So yes, the more more efficient, quicker response, there is quicker communication, the smoother everything is throughout the entire transaction. Uh, because there are, there are instances where the underwriter is human and they have their checks and balances to, to review everything. Sometimes their initial approval will satisfy those conditions and then there'll be a secondary conditional approval that will have something new on there. So if we're you know waiting till the to the 11th hour to submit some documents and then kind of get caught off guard with a, one additional item it yeah. could it could really delay things overall yeah and uh, so that's where like i feel like you are really good at keeping your clients and the agents up to date right like mm -hmm. how do you handle communication yeah so it'd be at, at least once a week i'm calling touching base with the buyers and with with their realtors just letting them know where we're at in the progress uh, in the process, most of the time it's simply, hey, you know, we're on we're on pace. Underwriter has reviewed everything. Thanks for getting the documents to me. We're on pace to close. This is the next major thing that's ahead of us. Um, other times it's it, it may be more than once a week if if the underwriters come up with something unexpected. Again, it's it's a rare case, but if they come unexpected, I'm not going to wait until next week to give you a call. <laughs> I'm going to call right away, especially you know yeah. for you, Jennifer. You want to know where okay. things are at in case there's anything that you have influence right. or control over. Right, because there could be negotiation pieces, like if the appraisal comes mm -hmm. in um, and not quite what we're expecting, if we have to like renegotiate, you know, who's gonna cover the amount of the appraisal. Like, and I think sometimes people don't understand like what happens when the appraisal comes in low. Like from a lender standpoint, then you will only appraise, you'll only give a loan to the appraised amount, right? Correct, the, the loan is always based on the lower 
of the purchase price and the appraised value. So if the appraisal comes in below purchase price, then yes, the loan amount would be lowered accordingly. Which makes sense because there's no asset mm -hmm. in theory backing up what that new loan amount would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we're working through the process. Let's say you requested new documents, they got them to you. And where are we headed now? Now we're headed, you know, the underwriter, we, we provided everything. The underwriter has reviewed all of their conditions and signed off on all of their conditions. So now we're at the point of being clear to close, which basically means fully approved, <laughs> which is awesome. That means that, you know, for the most part, your work is done. My work as the, the lender, my processing team, our work is done. Your work as a realtor is pretty and much close. done. The final piece is, and still a critical piece, now the title companies, title company that's representing the buyer side and the seller side, they have to get together and review all of the financials, all the accounting, accounting that goes into it, where um, they're reviewing all of the prorations in the accepted offer, could be for utilities or property taxes, and they are coordinate all of that in addition to being able to pay off the seller's loan if they have a, a lien on the property to boil down who is getting paid what at the closing table. And so yeah. their their job, they can't start that until we get the clear to close from the underwriter. So as you were saying, the getting documentation and being efficient with that, if that's a slower process, well then we're putting the title companies up against a uh, up against the clock and they they can't necessarily do things overnight. That there are a lot of searches that they need to do in time that they invest and and we want to get that information to them as quickly as possible because there's a certain amount of days that they have to get your closing statement to you to review before you can actually close like we can't get the closing statement and have you review it the same day mm -hmm. uh, is it two it's days three, 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 three business days. days so three business days before closing is when you know the lender is obligated to have that closing disclosure initial closing disclosure to you to review right and so to review, so I said to review and sign. So it's not just, hey, here we sent you an email, make sure to look at it. It's no, this is an email. I, I like to set up another Zoom call, just five, 10 minutes to review items in there and compare how it's different from that initial loan estimate that we've provided. Yeah, I think that is so important because I think uh, like that you know all the pieces and you don't make any assumptions. Like there's been things going on, make sure that we're mm -hmm. all agree on the payments, the pieces going into it. And that's where like, like if, and then I think sometimes clients think the back of their head, you're working just toward closing day, but you're really working to days before that mm -hmm. to get all the pieces in place and kind of like to dive in a little more like TJ was saying about the title. So yeah, like you have all these different pieces working together, you know, agents writing your offer while that, and you know, we're kind of working through the inspection while TJ is going through getting the appraisal set up, getting, working with underwriting and then title is taking, you know, kind of all the pieces and saying, okay, well, what is the bottom line going to be here? Who do we have to pay off? What is the seller? Are they doing a credit? What's the buyer's credit? You know, who's paying taxes for this year? <clears throat> and so it really is a lot of people working together to, you know, it seems like you know, we accept it offer, we get our documents to TJ, we're done, but there's really a lot going on. Absolutely. And all of that movement with the title companies, that can be why it's hard to really give um, an exact closing cost. How much cash does someone need to wire for closing day? It's hard to know until the title, or it's, it's, it's unlikely to know until the title companies have, had, have been able to review and compare their analysis of the financials. So yeah. while I'll, I'll be able to provide a conservative estimate, I can never tell you exactly what it is until the title companies have done yeah. so. And I like what you said that you hop on a Zoom, because I think, uh, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what's going on. So it'll just like sign whatever. And I think it's really important. I've been actually trying to implement, to implement that more into like all of my contracts that we sign, listing contract, any offer mm -hmm. is we hop on a Zoom. And if they don't want to hop on a Zoom, I at least record a video to go through all the pieces. So I think it's so good that you do that because I think it really helps clarify, you know, like, yes. like we get used to things and I think nothing of it, but it, I think it's really important if people aren't mm -hmm. doing it every day. And it le leaves the door open for you to have an opportunity to ask a question that may may not come to mind as you're looking through it on your uh, looking through a document on your own. But if we're able to have a conversation and talk through it, more likely that the question that is buried somewhere in in your brain is going to come out and be answered to make you feel more confident. Like triggered. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we got our you know you got our clear close, which I love that day, <laughs> and then you got it over to title. Title brings the pieces together. 
So what happens on closing day? Are you there? How does the money get transferred? Yeah. So, well, important step, probably the, one of the most important steps of the whole process is, is getting money to the title company. So most of the time this is done by a wire transfer that you would have to initiate at your bank or credit union. And I always recommend going at least 24 hours before your closing because wire transfers aren't instant. You know, sometimes they can go through in a matter of hours, but you can't expect to go in at closing time on a Thursday and money needs to be at the title company for an eight o'clock closing Friday morning. <laughs> don't do that. So don't, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> do Give yourself that. more more leeway, more time uh, because you will wire your funds, your total cash to close. So that is your total closing cost. It's your total initial escrow deposit and your down payment. You will send that to the, the title company because the title company is going to hold all of those funds and spread them out accordingly. So they're going to spread out to pay off the, the seller's mortgage. They're going to they're going to take portions of that to make sure there's enough money in your escrow account to satisfy the escrow balance that's needed for that time of the year. So you have property taxes ready to be paid. Um, it's going to go to pay all of the parties, you know, both sides of the, the realtor transaction. It's going to go help to pay both of those agents at the time of, of closing. And then and then the um, the main another component of it is the my the lender who's ultimately funding the loan initially, they are sending money to the tenant company to then be sent off. And do they do that like house. before, like the same day before or something like that? When does the lender do that? Correct. Yeah, it's usually usually in the hours leading up to it. Okay. That they'll coordinate. So yeah, the title the title companies they do way more than just helping you know show you where to sign on a piece of paper. They are <laughs> they are an integral piece that is almost all behind the scenes. Right, and all of a sudden they show up, and so like you're at the closing table. Like the people that you'll see is like generally your agent will be there, and if like if you're the seller by the way and you pre-sign, your agent will still likely show up, so you represent a distant case like. God forbid something hits the fan, they're there. Um, if you're the buyer, your agent will be there. The title person will be there. But generally, the lender's not there, right? I, I mean, I'd like to be there for any, any of them that are local. And as long as I'm not required to be picking up a kid from school or anything <laughs> like that, I, I do like to be there. Because in today's day and age, yes, we may have had two or three Zoom calls, but it could be the only chance I have to meet you in person. And... Um, I'm a, I'm a huge believer of the in-person connection, so I try to make as many closings as I can. Yeah, I th I think that's so important too because also I feel like uh, it's never it's like an ongoing relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Like may, I mean, maybe on another video we'll do is talking about like refinancing mm -hmm. or you know things like that or like referrals too, which are important to both of our businesses. Um, and you know that's like I know like. Like the, all this process that we just talked about, I know both of our goals is to give you such great service that two things, you want to leave us an amazing review, I'll take those, but also like you are so happy with what we've done that you want refers to other people and that, you know, we don't take that lightly. Like we feel like we really, you know, we need to excel and not just do the ordinary, like, yeah, that's what you're expected to do. Um, and I think that's like behind the scenes is really our goal to just give like exceptional service to you. Yeah. yeah. The closing day, it's not the finish line. It's more of a, more of a, a checkpoint because mm -hmm. once we close, um, and I'm going to follow up with you a week after just to see where things are at. See, you know, your head might still be spinning. It's to, to understand where you're at. Um, see if you had any lingering questions from the closing day process. Uh, but then within four or five, six months, I'm going to check in again to see again where things are at and if by chance rates have moved to a point where we can talk about refinancing it, yeah. it wouldn't be common to be able to refinance that quickly but hey if it is let's get let's get moving we can help lower your rate and then every year i'll be following up do an annual mortgage review where one just really want to want to see where life has taken you to that point see how everything is going with the house see financially are there any needs that can be met if we were to adjust your mortgage it doesn't necessarily have to mean refinancing to a lower interest rate maybe life took a turn and you accumulated more debt and it makes sense to try and build that into your mortgage so uh, i, I want to keep that at least an every every year touch base so that as your life changes you know i'm there to help and guide along the way and like i really encourage you like i know because that's how we do too we try to like follow up, maybe give you a market analysis each year. Um, 
And to take advantage of that, like it might seem like, oh, Jennifer wants to talk to us again about it, or TJ wants to talk, take advantage of it. Because if you think about it generally, it's like your largest asset. And there's opportunities to maybe, like you said, reduce your payment or use it for other finances. And it's it's kind of like not seeing your doctor every year, but kind of like, you know, the health of your assets. So I like really encourage you to take the opportunity to, you know, hop on a quick call or, you know, and. I feel like it makes a difference financially. Also, because like, you know, being in the industry, like I think we see opportunities that you might not think of because, you know, you're not thinking about it every day. So I would just encourage you to like take the time to have those opportunities to talk to TJ or talk to your agent, you know, every year, every six months. Mm -hmm. So anything else that we, do we not cover? I, I think we think we got it all at this I think point. So. Yeah, I, I like the idea of coming back and re revisiting when it makes sense to yeah. finance, what goes into the refinance process, and also if someone's looking to sell, what that yeah what that process looks like. Yeah, so part four we just did today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Jennifer Zeller, Abundance Real Estate, TJ Ebert, Provisor Mortgage. We look forward to seeing you for part four. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. So